nuclear energy. I've meant to do this video for a while, but you know, other stuff gets in the way and I knew this one would kind of be a pain to just do. But I do think it's important, particularly for my audience, people who are interested in veganism or who are vegan, or at the very least are just interested in reducing their meat consumption. People like that tend to be left-leaning or fully on the left, and people on the left, at least a sizable portion of the left, is anti-nuclear. I consider myself on the left, but I'm definitely not anti-nuclear, and here's why. So we are really, really bad at assessing risk. We tend to rank much higher risks that are more dramatic. So think like shark attacks, lightning strikes, things like that, despite these things being extremely unlikely. Traveling by plane or train versus traveling by car is a perfect example. You are much more likely to die in a car crash mile for mile traveled than you are to die in a plane or a train crash. And yet many people choose to drive or fly or take a train because plane and train crashes just are so much more dramatic and they haunt us in ways that your kind of average car crash doesn't. And when it comes to public safety and your own personal risk, the same is true for nuclear energy. For each petawatt hour of electricity generated, far, far more people are killed by coal than by nuclear power. In fact, nuclear is even safer than rooftop solar. That may seem hard to believe, so I have some figures here to try to put it into perspective. Fukushima, you probably remember Fukushima. How many people do you think died from radiation? A hundred? A thousand? Tens of thousands? So far, officially, it's one. Last year, the Japanese government compensated the family of one of the workers who died of lung cancer. And the government has also acknowledged four other workers diagnosed leukemia or thyroid cancer as having been caused by radiation exposure. And for the general population outside of the most affected zones, the World Health Organization doesn't expect any discernible increase in cancer from environmental exposure. And this really isn't surprising once you look at the amount of exposure. Ultimately, the exposure in the first year for civilians, aside from the workers, in the most affected area of the Fukushima prefecture was only 25 millisieverts at most. That's half the occupational safety limit of 50 millisieverts. While the effects of low levels of radiation aren't well known, there are some theoretical upper bounds for the increase in risk. For example, a 70% increased risk of thyroid cancer for the most sensitive group, female infants. That sounds really bad and really dramatic, but we have to remember that that is a relative risk, not an absolute one. The baseline lifetime risk of thyroid cancer for females is just three quarters of 1%, and the additional lifetime risk estimated in this assessment for a female infant exposed in the most affected location is one half of 1%. Obviously only time will tell, but given the relatively small population of people who were exposed to even these modest amounts of radiation, the small population of sensitive individuals, and the increase in screenings and preventative measures, it's perfectly plausible that we won't see any increase in mortality from the radiation exposure. Now, a lot more people did die in connection to Fukushima but not from radiation. Thousands died from the earthquake and the tsunami, and over 2,000 more from stress, suicide, and lack of medical care. The evacuation and social panic has killed far more people than the radiation. Three Mile Island is a similar story, except that nobody died in the accident. And a statistically significant increase in cancer deaths in the area has never been discovered. And then there's Chernobyl. So 30 to 31 people died during or shortly after, two from the blast itself and the rest from acute radiation exposure. And a few more would eventually die from cancer caused by the radiation. It's difficult to estimate how many due to the state of Soviet health records. The number of people who died from long-term radiation is even harder to discern, but most of the estimates are in the tens of thousands. On the other hand, the UN Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation has declined to give a number due to lack of a reliable epidemiological baseline or good data on exposure, particularly among cleanup workers. But evidence does suggest an increased incidence of leukemia and cataracts among the several hundred thousand people involved in the recovery operation who received higher doses, and an increased incidence of thyroid cancer in the public. The Soviets prioritizing infrastructure preservation over human lives by sending in thousands of poorly equipped, poorly trained workers shortly after the accident 
is atrocious. We have pretty much no idea what kind of exposure these people got, and only continued monitoring will tell us how some of these workers may be affected. However, beyond thyroid cancer, the UN committee reports that to date, there has been no persuasive evidence of any other health effect in the general population that can be attributed to radiation exposure. This actually makes a lot of sense. Radioactive iodine was released in the explosion. Our thyroids are always absorbing iodine, particularly in the context of an iodine deficiency, which was present in the region. So you would expect to see more cases of thyroid cancer after a fallout from a meltdown and explosion like Chernobyl. The low levels of radiation aside from the iodine that most civilians were exposed to would not be expected to cause significant increases in cancer since they only got a few times background radiation exposure. It's also worth noting that something like Chernobyl could not happen today because the very reactor design was totally different. Chernobyl was a terrible design even by the standards of its time. The reactor was designed such that if it got too hot without enough water coming in, the water could easily start boiling. And this would form voids, thus lowering the density of the water in the reactor, water that was slowing down the reactor, and letting the reactor get even hotter. There also wasn't a containment shell, which could have greatly reduced fallout. Modern water-mediated reactors are nothing like this. If the water is lost, they shut down on their own because they rely on the water as a mediator to slow down neutrons and sustain fission. This LA Times article has more details if you're interested, although apparently the idea that there was a graphite fire is contentious. There are plenty of other minor nuclear events that have been subject to media sensationalism and fear-mongering, just like Chernobyl and Fukushima and Three Mile Island, but the story is pretty much the same. Rarely ever a single casualty and no projected harm to the general public. The bottom line is that even considering these higher estimates of tens of thousands of people eventually dying from Chernobyl from radiation, nuclear meltdowns and radiation leaks just aren't a serious public threat. But other power sources, particularly coal and oil, which replace these nuclear reactors when they are shut down, they absolutely are. While certainly less dramatic than a nuclear accident, the death toll of coal pollution is extreme. The existence of nuclear power, even in the limited amounts that we have now, prevents an average of 76,000 deaths per year. This is simply by getting rid of the pollution that would have otherwise been produced had that energy been made with fossil fuels. The total death toll from fossil fuel burning is much higher in the hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions annually. And that's not even considering the deaths caused by climate change, of which fossil fuel burning is the leading factor. Obviously, animal agriculture is also a big factor. It's on par with transportation, but these are secondary to energy production. Every single shutdown nuclear plant means that energy gets replaced primarily by fossil fuels, no matter what Sanders says. The issue of emissions and climate change is beyond dispute. Nuclear energy is one of the best cleanest forms of energy. It's even better than solar when it comes to energy returned on energy invested. Solar power has a large theoretical range of 8.7 to 34.2 in a sunny area, which is mostly based on manufacturing energy input rather than efficiency of the cells. But even the very best cases are less than half of nuclear, which is over 70. And there are other problems. Unfortunately, most solar technology just isn't viable yet at a large scale. This is because of the amount of energy returned on the investment and the need for storage to solve the intermittency issue, which compounds the problem in all but the most reliably sunny areas or those with ideal environments for pumped water storage. There are both economic and growth issues with that. Basically, if you want to maintain your quality of life as a privileged member of a developed country, you need an EROI of around 7. A worse EROI means some level of personal sacrifice, which we may not be willing or able to make. And for many systems, real-world solar EROI drops below that number, even with very efficient storage. And not having a high EROI can also make growth difficult. This study found that in some cases, adding storage makes it impossible for certain technologies to bootstrap themselves at all. Now, the majority of relevant studies are already a few years old, which can mean a lot in a quickly advancing field like solar technology. But when a new technology purports to be able to do something extraordinary, it is up to the advocates of that technology to present that data, credible data, 
proving that. Given the unknown lifespans of some of these technologies and the ease with which EROI numbers can be fudged, just using different methodologies, there's reason to be skeptical of strong claims that haven't been subject to scrutiny. Today, given the options that are already widely deployed and proven, the results speak for themselves. We have to remember that currently, when we ask whether we should support nuclear, we're really asking whether we should support nuclear or fossil fuels. We should absolutely support these technologies where it makes sense, but in order to meet our targets, in order to avoid the worst case scenarios of climate change, we have to employ a mix that includes nuclear power. New technology in solar cells and storage will probably change that in the next couple of decades, but can we really wait? We're in a climate crisis. Can we really wait is it really something that we're willing to sacrifice millions of lives to while we continue to rely on fossil fuels in the interim? While the share of energy production from renewable technologies is slowly growing, 96% of global energy production is produced from fossil fuels, nuclear, and traditional biomass sources. Our global transition to renewable energy systems will be a process which takes time, an extensive period during which we must make important choices on bridging sources of energy production. The safety of our energy sources should be an important consideration in designing the transitional pathways we want to take. And here's about when I looked at my phone and realized just how much I had left to record and how long I had already been recording <laughs> and decided to finish up tomorrow. Tomorrow being today. But of course, climate change is not all that people are concerned about. One of the, I think, biggest concerns regarding nuclear power is nuclear waste. What are we going to do with the nuclear waste? It's going to be radioactive for thousands of years. Think about the children. Think about future generations. That sort of thing. So I tried to establish, um, just by going over the nuclear incidents and whatnot, that even fresh radiation is diluted just by the local environment. Aged material is even less of a problem because radioactive iodine, which has a half-life of eight days, is pretty much gone after a couple of months. But in terms of sequestering the leftover materials where they won't affect anybody, the scientific consensus on the safety of long-term storage, meaning thousands of years, is pretty clear. There are a number of repositories being pursued and developed around the world, including in the US. A lot of fuss is being made about how long this is taking, but ultimately this is due to bureaucracy and unscientific public complaint, not any fundamental technical or safety challenges. Not every country has its shit together as well as Finland. It's costing the US government money <laughs> for violating agreements that they made with utility companies to take over this waste, but there's no reason to be concerned about the safety of current short-term storage practices. Spent nuclear fuel from commercial reactors is currently stored on site at nuclear power plants around the country. While it is safe and secure in these locations, a long-term solution is needed to ensure that the public and environment continue to be protected. Long-term meaning thousands of years. Nobody credible is worried about this being a threat in the next few decades. If you're still concerned about this, if you're still wary of scientific consensus, take this ridiculous, totally irresponsible scenario. We could, if we really wanted to, just take all of this waste and spread it out into the ocean and the radiation would become so diluted that it would be undetectable. And I don't even mean responsible ocean disposal, like in sealed casks. This is something that used to be done until the 90s and for which studies have generally not detected radiation in the surrounding area or they've detected such low levels that environmental impact was determined to be negligible. What I mean is the dispersal of the material directly into the water and just spreading it out. The ocean is 1.35 billion cubic kilometers of water, and there's already around a quarter million tons of high level waste, which is the only waste that we're really concerned with. Other waste is short lived. That would amount to less than 0.2 picograms per liter. A picogram is one trillionth of a gram. To put that into perspective, there's already about three micrograms of naturally occurring radioactive uranium dissolved in every liter of seawater. That's three million picograms. Adding 0.2 picograms per liter would not make any discernible difference to the amount of radiation. The idea that a single person or even just a single fish would die from that is pretty far-fetched. And consumption of seafood likely wouldn't have any effect either. Even with bioaccumulation, the radiation dose is negligible. 
For example, this study found that radioactive plutonium that accumulated in nearby fish from Chernobyl in Gdansk Bay Gdansk? was under three millibecquerels. Since the dose factor from plutonium is about one millisievert, that amounts to three nanosieverts exposure from one kilogram of fish, which is 2.2 pounds, which is far less than the 98 nanosieverts you get from eating one banana. Then you want to divide that by another 7 billion for what an ocean of dilution would be. It's a, it's a pretty tiny number. But again, this is totally irresponsible. This is not something we would do. We would not just dump the waste into the ocean. And it's probably a good idea not to drop sealed casks into the ocean either because of the possibility of tsunamis and other events washing them ashore where they might hurt people. There has been investigation on burying this stuff under the ocean floor where it would be stable, but ultimately it's just more practical to store this stuff on land in geologically stable regions where it will never move in millions of years. My point is that the earth is very, very large. And even if there is some leak of nuclear waste slowly over time, over a few hundred years into groundwater, assuming that it's spread out, then we're ultimately talking about insignificant changes over just background radiation. The only serious problem is when large amounts of radioactive iodine get dispersed into the air or enter the food supply in localized areas. Sometimes things that we assume to be really big, really terrifying problems like nuclear waste just aren't. So aside from accidents and leaks, there's obviously intentional nuclear threats. Nuclear security is no doubt one of our biggest global issues. It is scary and it's scary for good reason. Nobody wants a nuclear winner. But nuclear weapons are not nuclear power, and the latter does not encourage or lead to proliferation of the former. Nuclear weapons rely on highly enriched uranium. Nuclear power plants use very minimally enriched uranium. It's like the difference between a stick of dynamite and a candlestick. Uranium can be enriched using centrifuges, but so can any mineral source. Both are beyond the ability of terrorists. And you're not saving a rogue nation much time at all if you're giving them uranium fuel because they still have to do most of the work. Just getting uranium from rocks, a chemical process, is much simpler. And there are serious engineering obstacles to producing actual fission bombs and getting them where you want them. There are breeder reactors, which are great for making the most out of your fuel, but those are technologically non-trivial as well, and basic international inspections can prevent misuse. And even if you are worried about a rogue nation using a breeder reactor, that's no reason to oppose nuclear power in peaceful developed nations that already are nuclear powers or are allied with nuclear powers. More plausible is the threat of a dirty bomb, which is a conventional bomb that gets mixed with a bunch of radioactive material get, that gets spread with the blast. Terrorists could do this, but why? Why would they break into and steal radioactive material, spending hours digging it out and without the proper equipment, probably killing themselves in the process of taking it and leaving a trail of bodies and cut locks, broken cement, etc., to turn law enforcement onto what they're doing just to create a bomb that gives itself away by easily detectable radiation and is not fundamentally more dangerous than run-of-the-mill bioterrorism that they can engage in from the privacy of their basements. Yes, people can be very, very stupid. Terrorists can be very, very stupid. But honestly, I would rather them try to go the nuclear route and get caught doing it than the bioterrorism route, which is a whole lot easier to pull off. But there's an even more absurd scenario regarding terrorists. And this comes from the Union of Concerned Scientists. They're in the business of fear mongering over nuclear power, recognizing the irrefutable fact that nuclear can lower emissions, but then fabricating safety concerns. Very similar to how some conservatives admit that climate change is happening, but either say that, oh, humans aren't causing it, or yeah, humans are causing it, and it's actually a good thing. Anyway, I'm just gonna quote their ridiculous scenario. Although the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ordered modest security upgrades at Indian Point and other nuclear power plants in response to the 9-11 attacks, the plants remain vulnerable, both to air attacks and to ground assaults by large terrorist teams with paramilitary training and advanced weaponry. Many question whether the NRC's security and emergency planning requirements at Indian Point are adequate, given its attractiveness as a terrorist target and the grave consequences for the region of a successful attack. Beyond the absurdly inflated fatality predictions, this type of attack has never happened on US soil and there's no reason believe, to believe that it ever would. This kind of deployment is not accessible to terrorists. And even if they did have those resources, there are a lot of other ways to do a lot more damage with a lot less effort. 
Regardless, and thanks in part to fear-mongering from people and organizations like the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Indian Point plant is scheduled to be shut down. Now where once 10% of New York State's electricity needs were being produced by this plant with virtually no greenhouse gas emissions, essentially all of that burden will be taken up by fossil fuels, and the pollution that results in the state will cost real human lives. Far more than the most successful terrorist attack on Indian Point could have ever done. So good job, the terrorist of one. Aging plants need funding for repair or at most total replacement with newly commissioned plants. What we don't need is to shut them down, increasing pollution and accelerating climate change. Even without repair, the oldest and most problematic reactors online today are still less problematic are still the lesser of two evils when compared to the practical alternative. There is no doubt that nuclear is more expensive than fossil fuels. This is largely because of externalities that dirty power isn't paying for, like its environmental footprint. And unfortunately, there's good reason to be pessimistic about its future given public perception after Fukushima. It seems the only way to save nuclear power would be a fairly dramatic change in public perception and political support, far more money dedicated to research and construction of new plants, and a willingness to pay a premium for clean power. In other words, fuck. There is a reason that every major science-based analysis of decarbonization has recommended a diversified portfolio that includes nuclear. Solar and wind are great in some places, but the intermittency issue remains a problem in many areas. There are places where we don't just have cloudy days, but cloudy weeks. Energy from fossil fuels is primarily what will be used to cover those gaps in production. By not including nuclear as an option, we pin all of our hopes on speculative advances and commercial viability of new storage technologies. And if that doesn't happen, then we're stuck with fossil fuels. It would be like pinning all of our hopes on clean meat and speculative technological solutions to animal agriculture because plant-based meats and reduced tarian messages can be a hard sell. There's a lot to hope for. There's a lot to get excited about. I am a huge supporter of clean meat. I am very excited about the future of clean meat. But look, currently there is no clean meat product on the market. It's still a huge unknown. Reasonable people can disagree about the path of least resistance and even whether or not we can actually solve all of our problems without nuclear power. And I can even see somebody just giving up on nuclear power completely and devoting all of their hopes, their personal activism, their donations towards solar and wind and making solar and wind viable. What doesn't make sense to me is to fail to be supportive, even in spirit, of nuclear proponents' shared cause, or worse, to actively oppose it, to call for existing plants to be decommissioned. Because for the foreseeable future, opposing nuclear power means supporting fossil fuels. Okay, so that was, that was a lot. I hope you liked it. It's probably kind of boring. I'm sorry. I don't know how to make videos like these uh, interesting. Anyway, I do hope you enjoy it. I hope you get something out of it. I'm sure the comments are just going to be super fun. And, uh, subscribe, support the channel, patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. I'll have a new video soon. You guys always ask for vlogs whenever I ask for video suggestions, but you gotta understand, I can't do that. <laughs> like, that would require showing my family because obviously I spend a lot of time with my family and I'm not going to do that. So I'm not sure exactly what you expect from the vlog. Like, hey, I'm about to work on a video. Okay, bye. <laughs> like, hey, I'm, I'm about to go spend time with my family. Okay, bye. Oh, I just spent time with my family. It was good. I just played Okami for 30 minutes and then baby woke up. That was, it was cool. I just ate lunch, forgot to film it because I was very hungry and I just scarfed something down. It was good. I just took a shower. I hate taking showers. It's one of those things I have to do every day and I hate it. I hate water if I'm being honest. I hate pools. I hate the ocean. I hate lakes. I like baths. So that's the only, <laughs> the only um, context in which water is okay for me. Uh, I don't even like drinking water. I do it because it's it's good for me. But to be honest, I'd rather just drink coffee all day, every day. Is this what you want? <laughs> is this is this the kind of content you guys want? Because I can give that to you. I'm sorry, I just don't have a particularly interesting life. I mean, it's interesting to me, but I'm self-aware enough to know that it's not going to be interesting to anyone else, right? Because it's mostly, you know, I'm a mom of two young kids. So a lot of my life 
revolves around my children right now. Yeah, I can't really like, hey, I went to this cool, I don't know, what do vloggers do? I don't watch vlogs. So I'm <laughs> realizing that I'm comparing myself to something that I'm imagining because I don't actually know what vloggers do. I'm guessing it's like, you know, here's my cool house. I live in LA. So there's cool stuff to walk around and show you or like here's my friend who's also beautiful and has perfect skin <laughs> and is very young and obsessed with herself that's not really fair but look if you're gonna vlog about yourself you've got to be a little bit like self-absorbed I guess I mean anyone who makes videos of themselves you've got to be a little bit like you know what I'm saying I don't know what that means everyone likes talking about themselves I guess is what I'm saying including me, but I don't think many people are interesting enough to warrant making videos about their lives. And I'm definitely one of those people. And I know that. So I'm not going to do it. That's it.